All right. On behalf of the Emergency Committee for Rojava, I would like to welcome you all to this memorial event for the beloved co-founder of our organization, Meredith Tax. Meredith was a lifelong feminist activist, organizer, and writer. She was a mentor and a dear friend to many of us. And we gather today to celebrate her life dedicated to justice and freedom. Today, we will listen to Meredith's political biography and hear from her family and friends who are joining us from across the globe. And before we start the program, I would like to recognize and thank the organizing committee who put this memorial event together, Anya Bree, Anna Sara Malmgren, Rivan Mevlud, and Debbie Bookchin. I also want to acknowledge Meredith's son, Elijah Tax Berman, for being with us today. And I will check to see if Eli, did you join us? Um, because if you did, I would like to start with you and give the floor to you. No problem. Okay. Thank you, Eli. Thank you, Eli. The floor is yours now. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for taking the time to gather here today in honor of my mother. Um, you know, it's a happy time and a, a sad time for all of us, as you can imagine. Um, <clears throat> you know, my mother would have been very happy to see the turnout, very appreciative of all of you for undertaking this cause. Um, it was a cause that was dear to her heart. She cared very deeply about and the cause that she's been fighting for for most of her life. Um, early on, my mother always spoke to me about equal rights for women and difference between right and wrong and how a good man should treat others. And I've tried to go into my life with the lessons that she taught me, and I hope to pass them on to my friends and family. Um, you know, we miss my mother dearly, and she was taken from us too suddenly. She was taken from us before she could finish her last book. She was taken from us before she could finished seeing her work with the ECR complete. And obviously she was taken from us before we could all properly say goodbye. Uh, I just hope that she continues to be our strength and spirit when we need her most. And she watches over us as we progress through life. Um, that's really all I want to say, Aza. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, dear Eli, for those words and for being with us today. Thank you for having me, it means a lot. Thank you. And thank you all again for joining us. Uh, we will now listen to Meredith's political biography. The biography will be read by Anasara Malmgren and Dravan Mevlut. I want to introduce them first. Anasara is a professor of philosophy at Inland Norway University and formerly at Stanford and UT Austin. She co-founded ECR together with Meredith Tax, Debbie Bookchin, and Robert Hockett, and was on the steering committee for the first few, year, few years. Ravan is an educator and a member of the ECR. We will start the biography with Meredith's childhood and student years now. Born to a Milwaukee Jewish family, Meredith proved to be a fighter from very early on. Her first fight was against her own mother, who, bitter about life, was frightened by the daughter's unbridled aspirations. Meredith later wrote, Her worst fight was when I was 11, and she made us move to the suburbs, white plight. I was already inspired by the kids fighting for civil rights in the South, whom I saw on newsreels, and I knew this was segregation. I fought the move as hard as I could, but I lost. Her father's family, on the other hand, were concerned about the child's display of intelligence, seen as inappropriate for her gender, fearing that nobody would ever marry her. It was through books that she realized that a different life was possible. And as soon as she could, she left Milwaukee for Brandeis University, a hub for troublemakers like herself at the time. 
From there, Meredith made her way to London with help of two prestigious scholarships. With an ambition, in her own words, ambition to become a famous writer and live in Europe. However, the academic world soon proved to be too divorced from the tumultuous events of the 60s. She later wrote, I was frozen in a little glass cage of intellectual alienation that was supposed to protect me. But in the spring of 1967, I came back to the US for a visit and everything burst in on me. The war, the racism, the violence, my family's craziness. The glass cage broke and when I got back to London, I couldn't sleep. I kept hearing the screams of Vietnamese children. So I plunged into the anti-war movement and began to study the world instead of English literature. Meredith came back to Brandeis for a teaching gig, but was soon blacklisted for supporting black students' militancy on campus, and she saw her job applications uniformly rejected. She took this as a sign of fate, giving up on the academic career without much resistance, resolving to dedicate her life to writing and activism, things that she actually wanted to do. We will now listen to the song, There Was a Young Woman Who Swallowed a Lie, written by Meredith, to the tune of There Was an Old Woman Who Swallowed a Fly by Alan Mills. She wrote the lyrics in 1970 when she was part of Bread and Roses, a socialist feminist group in Boston. It was recorded by Pete Seeger in his album, Banks of Marble. There was a young woman who swallowed a lie. I don't know why she swallowed the lie. Her pop shield died. There was a young woman who swallowed a rule. Lived to serve men, she learned it at school. She swallowed the rule to prop up the lie. But I don't know why she swallowed the lie. Perhaps she'll die. There was a young woman who swallowed some fluff, lipstick and candy and powder and puff. She swallowed the fluff to follow the rule, live to serve men, she learned it at school. She swallowed the rule to prop up the lie. But I don't know why she swallowed the lie. Perhaps Thank you. This is a good time to start to hear from Meredith's friends. And to start, we have Tema Kaplan, who is a lifelong communi community activist in civil rights, worldwide feminist struggles, environmental movements, and fights against homelessness and apartheid. She was Meredith's freshman roommate in college. Tema? Thank you for uh, this, and it's quite moving already. And I, I want to begin by showing you a, a, a picture of Meredith, uh, our freshman year in college. Um, I don't know if it's, uh, here we go, here we go. Uh, Meredith had a, a, a Meredith, wore hats beautifully and she uh, had a lot of them and uh, she wore them in as a way of, uh, of you know, take, being taken seriously since men wore hats at that period still. Um, and this is another uh, picture of Meredith. Um, let's see. Uh, this is another picture of Meredith, uh, it, probably our junior year in college. Um, and uh, when she had was thinking of being a great writer, and she felt that this was a way of being taken seriously. I don't think she actually really smoked at that time, but 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 the male writers whose pictures were taken have always usually had a cigarette. Um, Meredith uh, was destined for some kind of greatness, as, although it wasn't always clear what that form what form it would take. Uh, as we've heard, she was born in Whitefish Bay, uh, Wisconsin, and she dreamed of big cities. Uh, she then joined Angela Davis, uh, 
uh, Professor Paul Murray and uh, many other uh, rival activists uh, at Brandeis University in Waltham, Massachusetts. At the time it was a quite a, 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 it had many bourgeois students, but really it was very strong on leftist academics, including Herbert Marcuse and others. The uh, student body roughly consisted of children of communists, sec secular and religious, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim people, and numerous foreign students uh, subsidized by a, uh, a very wealthy uh, businessman from uh, Georgia who, uh, who actually gave the money and continues to give the money to Brandeis to bring in people who were not being brought in on uh, other uh, scholarships, um, it, uh, including Africa. We had many uh, birthday parties for uh, people whose countries were first being uh, uh, called in nations uh, at Brandeis. So it's a very left place, although there was also plenty of yeah, um, 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 Can you hear me? Sorry, Tema, we now muted. No, no, that's okay. Uh, and, uh, she, from, the, um, from the beginning, Meredith Mer 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 was a feminist and a spectacular writer at a time and place where there were plenty of liberals, there were not many feminists. In fact, in 1960, when we entered college, uh, uh, what we largely associated with feminism was a handful of British writers and older women who had uh, graduated from the traditional women's colleges. But Meredith was all, had already read Doris Lessing's The Golden Notebook. I was not a feminist and I twice threw this book across the room, our, our joint, joint room because I, I felt she was too bourgeois at the time. But, but uh, Meredith saw what was right in feminism and especially in left feminism. And uh, she also read before she went to England, lots of British leftist feminist texts. Meredith, of course, led the way in all manner of things. She took courses and writers from partisan review uh, uh, editors and other left-leaning journals who were teaching at, at Brandeis at the time. She also wrote for the college newspaper. And pretty soon, although the, a first-year student, she was at the center of a student salon that united art and politics, a, a combination she pursued for the rest of her life. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Tema. Thank you. And now um, next we'll hear from Trudy Bennett, a longtime feminist and social justice activist living in Durham, North Carolina, whose friendship and comradeship with Meredith goes back to the 60s in Boston. Trudy? Thank you. Hello to everyone. And thank you so much to the organizers for giving us this chance to come together. Meredith was passionate, but also flexible, open to new ideas and applications of her core beliefs. Her commitments were to socialist feminism, democracy, and human rights, not to any particular dogma. To understand the trajectory of her thinking over time, we can trace the organizations she helped create and her writings to guide strategies and inspire actions. The Rising of the Women, originally published in 1980, was reissued by Verso last year. This historical examination of US women workers organizing informed her belief in the need for autonomous women's groups participating and providing leadership in larger coalitions, an idea that guided her throughout her life and came full circle very recently. Meredith was the founding chair of CARASA, the Committee for Abortion Rights and Against Sterilization Abuse, an early group in New York that rejected a single issue approach to reproductive justice. After co-founding the Women's Committee in Penn American Center, she chaired the Women Writers Committee in International Penn to fight gender-based exclusion and the persecution of women writers. She also founded Women's World Organization for Rights, Literature, and Democracy. In, two, right. in 2011, right. she helped create and became board chair of the Center for Specular, Secular Space, a global women's group formed 
to strengthen secular voices, oppose fundamentalism, and promote universality and human rights. Through her feminist lens, she opposed the hypocrisy and danger of leftist groups offering uncritical support to anti-imperialist fundamentalists, even if they denied rights to women or to religious or sexual minorities. In 2013, she elucidated this campaign in Double Bind, the Muslim right, the Anglo-American left, and universal human rights. In the last decade of her life, as we all know, Meredith championed the cause of the Kurdish freedom movement, finding hope and a potential model in the decentralized, directly democratic, and deeply feminist struggle of Kurdish women and men resisting both ISIS and Turkish incursions in Rojava, Northern Syria. In her last book project, and she intended others, Meredith took on the formidable challenge of writing A Road Foreseen, Women Fight the Islamic State. A celebration of the acquisition of Meredith's papers by the Sally Bingham Center at Duke University in April 2012 revolved around the theme of how the interventions and methodologies of the women's liberation movement inform current and future social justice movements. Unwaveringly focused on this question, she made a plea for feminist intersectionality in her last article for The Nation a decade later in April 2022. Arguing for a new wave of autonomous US women's organizations formed by left feminists, she urged women to help build a broad national anti-fascist coalition while maintaining a feminist presence in left organizations. Meredith was a warm and inspiring mentor to multiple women whose leadership she nurtured and a steadfast, generous and emboldening friend. She also had a lighter side, a sharp wit and a devilish sense of humor. In all her work, she continued to recreate the intimacy and support she treasured from her early days in the women's movement. In one of the cards I sent to Meredith when she was in hospice, I thanked her for some of the many firsts she gave to me. My first place to live in Boston, my first car, an old Dodge Dart, my first down jacket and a beautiful woolen cape, my first affirmation as a writer, my first friend who published a novel and invited me to the publisher's launch at Katz's Delicatessen or maybe Carnegie Deli, which was really a treat. The first person who urged me to undertake a project, quote, because it would be good for me and prodded me into movement collectives and leadership spaces. My first role model of someone who made sacrifices by taking principled stands and my first guide to both the personal and political meaning of feminist solidarity, changing my life forever. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rudy. Thank you. Um, we will now hear from Irina Klepsis, the lesbian activist and poet who was a close friend of Meredith and shared some political work with her. Irina? Um, I haven't prepared any specific notes. Um, I want to talk mainly about Meredith and her idea of friendship, which I experienced, started experiencing at the late 90s and the beginning of the 2000s. Um, I found Meredith to be an extraordinary friend someone who was so engaged in politics, but who at the same time managed to make space for the personal and for the private. Um, I was very, very moved by her availability, despite all her work, to have an hour and a half conversation on some problem that I was having that I called her about, that she was willing to spend the time to talk to me, to probe with me issues about my own life, and also to share her own experiences. And one of the things that I watched 
was Meredith struggle through her own problems, talk about them, and yet at the same time continue working on her political work. She was just amazing. And as someone has just mentioned, she had, we shared, I mean, funny things. She guided me through sci-fi books that I needed to read in order to get away from anything that I needed to do. She um, had, an, had an incredible sense of humor. And at the end, you know, the last few years, I had my own health problems. It was very difficult to see her, but she was always there. And I particularly am grateful. I mean, she really helped me get through the death of my partner um, in 2014. Uh, Judy and I were together for almost 40 years. I was devastated by the loss. And she was there with her family to encourage me and to keep me moving. She was also fierce in her politics, which I really admired and sometimes was intimidated by a little bit. But I also found that she had that incredible rare combination of being both fierce and very gentle. She knew how to ask a difficult question in just the right way so you wouldn't get upset or defensive or whatever. And she had a kindness about her that I think was very rare. I miss her as a friend very, very much. And my condolences to her family. Thank you for including me. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. Thank you all. Um, we will now go back to reading Meredith's biography. And now we will be um, focusing on her early organizing years and her experiences in the male dominated left in the US that some of you talked to us a little bit about. Meredith's full-time career as an organizer began in Boston, where she co-founded Bread and Roses, an area-wide socialist feminist coalition of autonomous women's groups. It is here that she published her first major piece of writing, a four-part essay titled Women and Her Mind, The Story of Daily Life often considered a founding document of the women's liberation movement in the US. It is also here that Meredith came to realize the importance of strategic thinking for organizing towards radical change, a concern she retained throughout her life. She later wrote, Ravan, you may be muted. Yeah, we had no idea how we were going to make a revolution. I wanted us to put our money where our mouths were and have some kind of systematic approach to figure out how we were going to actually do it. How could we make sure women didn't end up behind the eight ball as we had in all the other revolutions? I kept asking the question. Nobody knew the answer. Most people didn't seem that worried about it, but I was. As Meredith was searching for answers, she discovered the Chinese Revolution. That encounter led her together with her then husband, a Marxist union organizer, to join the Maoist October League in Chicago. Their goal was to organize the industrial working class with special attention paid to racism and interracial coalition building. It is here that Meredith's feminist values and practice came to blows with the male dominated left. She later wrote, I don't can leave my, I said I would try. I knew it was a risk, but I wanted so much to learn how to think strategically. The Chinese had made a revolution. They clearly knew things they could tell. But Meredith had other things to be concerned about at the time as well. While working on a moving assembly line at Zenit TV, the only white person alongside black and Latina women, Meredith spent her evenings after work organizing with the Chicago Women's Liberation Union. Her lifelong preoccupation with coalition building showed itself in the 1973 March for Women's Equality and Economic Justice, 
that brought together all the women's organizations, labor unions, and other groups in the biggest women's rights demonstration in the city that anyone could remember at the time. But very few of Meredith's male comrades from the October League came. Her criticism of their lack of interest exacerbated her tenuous position within the organization. She later wrote, I think Ruan is having some connection problems. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Uh, so Anasara, maybe um, you can continue with the quotes, Ruan. I will then, yeah. Okay, please. As far as... Ruan? Okay, I'll continue for now. As far as the leaders of the October League was concerned, I had a bad attitude. I couldn't turn off my mind, couldn't stop thinking, and I kept pointing out things I thought were mistakes that should be corrected. This meant I kept challenging leadership, especially about sexism. You don't do that in a Leninist organization, not if you want to survive. Occasionally, my criticisms would prevail and I would be briefly thrust into leadership, but never for long. In August 1975, the inevitable happened and I was thrown out of the organization. Clearly none of the criticism and self-criticism I had done had worked. I was still hopelessly petty bourgeoisie and opportunist. My husband was completely disgusted with me. He said, why do you always have to be a lightning rod sticking your head up? I was made the object of a major rectification campaign and subjected to weeks of criticism, then kicked out. At that point, my husband left me. Suddenly, Meredith found herself a single mother of a one-year-old child, working as a nurse's aide at minimum wage in a hospital. In the years that followed, she would sleep, spend her sleepless nights completing her book, The Rising of the Women, while applying her strategic thinking skills to women's reproductive rights organizing in New York City. Once again, her insight into the importance of coalition building helped bring together white middle-class women fighting for abortion with mainly poor women of color advocating against forced sterilization. That coalition won the country's first sterilization regulations based on truly informed consent. Let's now listen to a song, The Battle Hymn of Women, written by Meredith in 1970 to the tune of The Battle Hymn of Republic and recorded by Betsy Rose in her album, Welcome to the circle. The glory of the flame of women's rage, they're smoldering for centuries, now burning in this age. No longer are we prisoners in that same old gilded cage. That's why we're marching on. Move on over, or we'll move. You're muted, Oslem. Um, okay, sorry. We will now watch a short clip of Meredith talking at the book launch for The Rising of the Women, republished by Werso last year. Um, my book, which I will show you, The Rising of the Women, is about a period in which industrialism was taking hold in the US in producing conditions of great hardship and economic brutality. The economy is different now. Most industrial jobs have migrated overseas, but the brutality remains. And today, as we learned during COVID, the most vulnerable are the quote, essential workers, domestic workers, agricultural laborers, nurses, lab techs, grocery store clerks and chicken slaughterers, truckers and people who pack Amazon packages. Yet the strategy that working women developed in the progressive era to organize into unions is still relevant, I think. And this strategy rests on what I call a united front of women, which is made up of socialists, trade unionists, and the left wing of the feminist movement, which then 
mobilizes other feminists. Thank you. One wants to watch more, right? When we see her, but we will hear from, we will see more clips later. Um, now we'll be joined by friends and we'll start with Myra Malkin, who's a retired legal services lawyer and a poet and a great friend of Meredith. When Meredith died, we had known each other for almost 60 years. We were roommates in London in the mid 1960s. I want to pay tribute to an aspect of her that's maybe surprising given her fierceness and her strong mindedness. More than almost anyone else I've known, she became able to view herself with objectivity. She would decide that she'd been wrong on some particular occasion, and she was willing to criticize her former stance and to apologize for what she'd said or done. I think that was related to how much she cared about justice and about truth. And second, I just want to say, like Irina, that I miss her so much. I keep wanting to tell her things, show her things, ask her things. She accomplished so much during her life, and she was also the most loyal, witty, and generous of friends. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Myra. Next, we have Hester Butterfield. Hester was a co-founder of Bread and Roses, printer at New England Free Press, and director of the Senior Citizens Coalition in Cleveland, among other things. Since 1986, she has lived in Germany, raising a family, working with refugees, and organizing against deportations. She's the co-founder of Jane Addams Zentrum and director of its community organizing project in a Munich settlement. Hester, floor is yours. Thank you so much for being able to be part of this wonderful, uh, I don't know whether it's a ceremony or, but it's wonderful. Thank you. I first met Meredith more than 50 years ago at meetings in my parents' home in Cambridge when groups were starting Bread and Roses and were working on the first newsprint edition of Women and Their Bodies, which later became Our Bodies, Ourselves. And I'm so glad to see Marilyn Slotkin is also here. We did the original layout together. Um, <clears throat> the friendship with Meredith grew when she brought articles to the New England Free Press, where I worked as a printer. It was always exhilarating in the literature committee and doing the running the presses to read sentences like, out of the conflict between the women's liberation movement and society will be born a creature who does not yet exist, a liberated woman. My memories of Meredith as a fiery pamphleteer with, who wrote pithy sentences are also of a friend who was always kind and caring, supportive. She was warmly interested in the lives and doings of others. When a few years ago, and this is an example, when a few years ago, I lost my vaccination certificate at the airport on which I had absentmindedly written her phone number. She told the airport workers who called her how to reach my son to get this back to me. And she had only met him once. How did she dig that up? And how? why did she care? It was, to me, an absolute symbol of the kind of person she was whose her life and her politics brought people together to get things done. Repeatedly, I experienced this. I will say thanks once again to all of you who organized this and I'm honored I had a chance to say something. Thank you. Thank you so much, Esther. Next, we'll hear from Avram Barlov, who has been a New York City public high school teacher for 43 years and a radical political and education activist 
since he was a teenager in the anti-Vietnam War movement. Thank you. Um, I first came to know Meredith many years ago through her work, uh, her outstanding work in the Committee for Abortion Rights Against Sterilization Abuse, a group whose work linked race, class, and gender analysis, um, anticipating what's come to be known currently as intersectionality. Several years afterwards, I knew her through mutual friends and through her former husband, Marshall Berman, and then we lost touch. But many years later, when my friend Bruce and I decided to attend an emergency committee for Rajava Forum, we saw that Meredith was speaking there. I was curious to see how much of the old fire and wisdom she'd retain, and I was not disappointed. She spoke at length without cliched rhetoric, mixing historical and political analysis with personal anecdotes and raising important questions about how the committee's work might be advanced. I was particularly struck on that evening and in other subsequent smaller uh, Rojava committee meetings by the fact that she spoke respectfully and as an equal to a mostly younger audience. I got to know Meredith much better in the past few years as a first-rate mind, a relentlessly intelligent organizer, and what Jewish folks call a mensch. Her considerable practical and theoretical contributions to feminism, socialism, anti-racism, and popular literature acknowledged by many here today, deserve further study. But what I'd like to underscore now is her ability to work with and le learn with, learn from much younger, far less politically experienced people respectfully, with openness, and with a spirit of solidarity. A long time ago at a party in a moment when friends and comrades were conceding that our youth would soon be behind us, we wondered aloud how we would interact with younger radicals when they took center stage. I hope, said someone, that we'll at least be able, we'll at least be willing to listen and question our own judgments when that happens. I'm a teacher who believes that students' ideas, voices, and questions must be central to the learning process. It's been my experience, however, that too many in my new left generation who prize youthful challenges to authority back in the day become frustrated and even dismissive when they encounter what they perceive as naivety, naivete, dogmatism, or repetition of their own mistakes among young, younger leftists now. But that was not Meredith's way. And her facility, her generosity, her appreciation of the work's larger importance is what I'll remember about her most. Thank you. Thank you, Avram. She truly was very generous with the younger participants. Um, next, we have Mia Herndon, who is an acupuncturist and organizer with Right to the City Alliance. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm really honored to be among so many who had the chance to love and to be in relationship with Mary, speaking and reflecting on what I often think of as a small giant <laughs> among many. Um, <laughs> so, because um, she was small in stature, we know it. I often, if she was getting in my car, I had to like have a little step stool or she was getting the acupuncture table, um, but her mind, not at all. Um, she's a force and her brilliant scholarship and friendship and love, a real gift. Um, and because she didn't suffer fools, um, or foolishness, she was quite honest. Uh, you knew how special you, you were to receive her love and, uh, and appreciation. As a friend, mentor, and someone I looked up to um, and wanting to consistently live by her example, she showed me um, how important our commitment to feminist leftist struggle is. Um, her skepticism and truth telling um, kept our conversations lively. Um, we debated a lot the agitation of young feminists, of Black feminists, of trans feminists. And although I can't recall, um, my memory is not as sharp as hers was the first time we met, although I know it was in the early aughts while I was at Third Wave Foundation, I can remember the indelible mark she left on me in my life over and over again. The ways that she organized me into caring about what she cared about, to think critically about organizational structure. Um, we had the opportunity to consistently sharpen um, when it came to um, how we show solidarity and unity with each other, 
She said that by example over and over again. It was not a theoretical concept. She brought people into her home. She called you. She talked to you. She brought you in. Um, she just gave without question, whether it was a critique, you know, she had no problem telling me, Mia, you do not look good. When I did that look good, <laughs> which I appreciated, that meant that I need to like work on something, right? She gave meals, she gave relationships, she gave clothes, she gave books, she gave furniture, <laughs> furniture and vases in my house with her. Um, she gave stories of her life and care. Every new venture I took on, she affirmed. Um, when I became an acupuncturist after having been in a feminist foundation for young people, she affirmed my acupuncturist feminist. She showed me how the way that I practice was indeed a value um, and it's carried out in different ways. And she taught me about protracted struggle. So not only were her commitments long, her friendships long, so she showed me that, you know, over time that it was important to still keep people in our lives. Um, to nurture those relationships and to grow. Um, for that, I, I am thankful to have been a part of her life. I miss her, and I appreciate you all for allowing me to be a part of this moment to honor her. Thank you. Thank you, dear Mia. Thank you all. We will now continue with Meredith's biography with a focus on her writing and internationalism. While co-chairing the Committee for Abortion Rights and Against Sterilization and Abuse, CARASA, which she had co-founded, Meredith turned to fiction in order to bring her politics to a broader audience. First came a children's book titled Families and based on her own experience as a single mother. In 1993, it became a censorship case when it was attacked by the Christian coalition and banned in Fairfax, Virginia schools for featuring divorced, single, gay, and lesbian parents. Meredith then wrote two historical novels, Rivington Street and Union Square, telling the stories of indomitable Jewish women who, like herself, wanted to change the world amidst the explosive events of the early 20th century. An acclaimed author, Meredith now took on the white male establishment of the writing world, co-founding, together with Grace Paley, Penn's first women's committee. It is in Penn that Meredith became a committed internationalist as she became founding chair of International Penn's Women's Writers Committee and fought against global gender-based censorship. Once again, her work was seen as too radical by an organization controlled by men. And devastated by the strength of the pushback, she went on to found her own organization, Women's World. Over the next 10 years, Meredith worked to strengthen and defend women's voices in Africa, Eastern Europe, India, and Latin America, while bringing up two children on her own after her second divorce. Following Women's World, despite ailing health and economic hardships, Meredith went on to co-found and chair the Center for Secular Space, a London-based organization which aimed to fight fundamentalism, amplify secular voices, and promote universality in human rights. As part of this work, she wrote the book titled Double Bind, The Muslim Right, The Anglo-American Left, and Universal Human Rights. Articulating a bold feminist secular line, she grappled with the question, but what happens when people who are mistreated by the state violate the rights of women? And she challenged a trope on the left that any feminist who criticizes the Muslim world is an orientalist ally of US imperialism. This line of work would eventually lead her to the Kurdish women's movement in Rojava. We will now hear from more friends. First, we have Gita Sagal, who's a writer, journalist, film director, and women's rights and human rights activist, whose work focuses on the issues of feminism, fundamentalism, and racism. Gita is the founder of the Center for Secular Space, where she worked with Meredith. Gita, floor is yours. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak. It's um, been very emotional listening to everybody's memories of Meredith and the wonderful um, 
biographical details that um, you've given. Um, I, I, I was so fortunate to have Meredith in my life at a time when I'd <clears throat> really taken on the politics of the human rights movement or where the politics of it had gone wrong. And that was what the Center for Secular Space and Meredith book, Double Bind, which you've just seen on your screens, emerged from. It seems that it, she was somebody who could put very complex ideas into very straightforward, simple language. And I think every single book of hers is a classic. But for me, because it was partly a defense of what I'd done, which was calling out Amnesty International, and then it later, in fact, all other human rights organizations through their unthinking alliances with Islamists, um, where instead of defending people's human rights, but also challenging the fact that they were, that, that some of the people they defended were themselves perpetrators of uh, genocidal politics, um, a lot of the left had decided, particularly in the West, this was in, in the what you call the Anglo-American uh, left, uh, had decided that if you were uh, going to be involved with politics on the war on terror, uh, you had to be, in effect, whitewashing Al-Qaeda and uh, the Taliban and numerous other Islamists. And she talked about five wrong ideas about the Muslim right, that it was anti-imperialist, that a defense of Muslim lands is comparable to national liberation struggles, and that terrorism is justified by revolutionary necessity, and so on. And she proposed a radical suggestion that's how about solidarity with actually protecting, uh, with so actual popular movements of Democrats and feminists struggling in the global South? How about recognizing that we all face an emerging conservative front in which Washington and the Muslim Brotherhood are more likely to be allies than adversaries and human rights are of no concern to either. And of course, she was very conscious of other kinds of fundamentalism such as Hindutva in India, which I now work with and maintained her relationship with writers across the world and the importance of everybody in being able to write and not just to write policy documents, um, or, or political pamphlets, which she did brilliantly, but to express themselves as fully as possible, whether it was through night classes or um, fiction in, in, in many different fields. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Gita. We will now hear from Bill Fletcher, a past president of Trans Africa Forum, a longtime trade unionist and writer. He has recently published his second novel. Bill, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and greetings to everyone. And uh, this is excuse me, a tremendous honor. Forgive me, I'm, I'm getting over COVID. Um, I met uh, <clears throat> Meredith in 1982 in Boston at a very large uh, energized book event for Rising of the Women. And I was pulled aside to meet her. I was a young Marxist um, and just simply in awe of her. Um, but I did not, after that, encounter her for years until the early 2000s again. And that's when we, we reconnected. Meredith's significance as a Marxist feminist has been spoken to by many I want to emphasize uh, and build off of actually what was just said um, in terms of her anti-authoritarianism and anti-imperialist socialist politics, her embrace of the Kurdish struggle, particularly in Turkey and Syria, was not happenstance. It wasn't a romantic attachment to a national liberation struggle. It was a recognition of something new. Uh, something new contained in these movements, the role of women and feminism, but also the belief in anti-authoritarianism. Meredith warned us away from static left categories and language. It was not enough to oppose traditional imperialism, but a genuine left should, all, should always be challenging any form of tyranny. It's funny, I remember inviting her to an interview or a panel, I can't remember which, and she warned me in advance that her ideas were somewhat unorthodox. 
And I started feeling sort of like Robert De Niro. You're talking to me, unorthodox. Um, and it was just a delight. I'm sorry that I could not say goodbye to her. I hope that her spirit senses my words, my sorrow, and our collective appreciation. But one final note. No matter how old Meredith got, she remained young and inspiring. And you know what? I remained in awe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. We really hope that she is sensing this, sensing all the love and appreciation. Um, we'll now uh, have Nestra King, a long-time activist and writer on ecofeminism. Nestra, floor is yours. Is Nestra with us? I'm not sure if she's with us. I've seen her earlier, but um, we'll... Um, okay, then we'll have Laura Mickham, and then we'll check with Nestra to see if she's with us. Laura Mickham is the director of the Sally Bingham Center for Women's History and Culture at Duke University, helps to acquire, preserve, and promote the use of a wide range of rare and unique materials related to women, gender, and sexuality history, the home of Meredith's archive. Laura, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I'm also getting over uh, a cold, so my voice is not at its best today. Um, but I want to thank you for inviting me to participate in this gathering and for all of your moving stories about Meredith. So um, we are the place, the Sally Bingham Center for Women's History and Culture, where Meredith's papers are preserved. And Meredith began placing her papers here in the Bingham Center in 2010. The collection includes extensive materials from activist organizations she was involved with, as well as drafts and manuscripts of her written work some personal correspondence, teaching materials, and audiovisual materials. The largest group of materials at over 130 boxes documents Meredith's long career as an activist, even before her leadership of Bread and Roses in Boston and through the Chicago Women's Liberation Group, CARASA, the Committee for Abortion Rights and Against Sterilization Abuse, the Native American Solidarity Committee, Women's World, and many, many others. I visited Meredith many times over the years and eagerly anticipated and enjoyed each occasion. A brief story about one of those visits. When fellow Bingham Center staffer Kelly Wooten and I worked with Meredith to pack her large and exciting collection in 2010, we were enveloped by her warm hospitality and charmed by the way her apartment was perfectly arranged for writing, reading, and making guests feel comfortable. Of course, as archivists, we were thrilled to have the opportunity to work with her beautifully organized and deeply meaningful files and library. We worked closely with her again the following year to plan a multi-day symposium mentioned earlier by Trudy Bennett to celebrate her papers and the contributions of a number of her activist friends, some of whom are here today, entitled Acting Across Borders, The Future of the Feminist 1970s. In addition to thought-provoking talks by more than a dozen scholars and activists, we held a spontaneous lunchtime sing-along led by Meredith uh, one of the songs we heard earlier in this gathering, a song that is requested almost every week by researchers. Of course, it's There Was a Young Woman Who Swallowed a Lie. Meredith's papers have been used hundreds of times by researchers from around the United States and the world, and we look forward to many more years of connecting readers with her extraordinary collection. Thank you, Meredith. Rest in power. Thank you, Laura. We will now hear from Rahila Gupta, a writer and journalist, chair of South Hall Black Sisters London, patron of Peace in Kurdistan, and member of Women Defend Rojava Committee UK. Rahila. Hello. Thank you very much for asking me to be part of this event. I feel truly privileged to be present in the company of Meredith's friends and family and political allies. On this sad but special occasion, thank you. So just to say a little bit about how I first uh, came across, um, I met uh, Meredith only once actually uh, in person in uh, when she was in London at the launch of her book, 
double bind. And it really was in her role as a passionate supporter of the Rojava Women's Revolution that I came to know her best. It was presumably, as others have said already, that Tax's lifelong commitment to the importance of secular spaces for feminists and other progressives, much under siege the world over, which partly drew her to the Kurdish struggle for self-determination and the women's revolution in Rojava. And the result of her interest was her really well-researched book, uh, A Road Unforeseen, which was published in 2016. And it was one of the earliest books in English on Rojava that I knew about. I remember reading it after spending uh, two weeks in Rojava in 2016. And I had interviewed dozens of women and I had done quite a lot of reading and I was on the long road journey back to Irbil to catch my flight to London. And I was both impressed and horrified that there were still such major gaps in my knowledge that Meredith's book was able to plug, even though it had been written at her desk uh, in New York. Meredith, I guess, had been witness to many false dawns of women's liberation. So naturally she approached this feminist revolution with the same degree of hope and skepticism that I share. The question that simmers under this book is, so what makes the Kurdish women's movement different? A particularly per pertinent question as it evolved out of PKK, the Kurdish work, work, Kurdish, Kurdistan Workers' Party, which began as a classic Marxist-Leninist party paying lip service to the equality of women. For all the doubts that Meredith expressed about Rojava, she concluded with a resounding affirmation that it is already clear that even under wartime conditions, Rojava may be very well, may well be the best place in the Middle East to be a woman, an opinion with which I concur. As is sadly the case with death, you discover more about the person after they have passed away. I knew very little about Meredith's rich and long history of activism and her novelistic output until I wrote her obituary for Media News, which is an online Kurdish news outlet. And I have discovered so much more today. We had many email exchanges on a variety of issues ranging from the controversy surrounding allegations of anti-Semitism in Ojalan's writings to Islamic fundamentalism in Pakistan. As with all great minds that pass away, I'm left with regret for all the debates that we did not have. And in Eliot's words, all the dust on a bowl of rose leaves that we did not disturb. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rahila. We will finally look into Meredith's work on Rojava, which Rahila got us started with. We will start here with a short clip of Meredith speaking at the Kurdish Film Festival in 2017. I just wanted to say, as somebody who's been active in the left and the feminist movement since the late 60s, I got interested in the Kurdish movement quite recently during the Battle of Kobani when I was blown away. And it was clear that something new was happening in terms of women, something uh, that I had never seen before in other revolutionary movements, and that women were unusually visible and unusually powerful. And it wasn't just one, it was a whole, I mean, often there's one heroic, you know, guerrilla woman. It's a whole lot of people. Um, and this is a real departure from Marxist tradition in which, as I said, there's actually one or two visible women and women's oppression is given some recognition, but doing anything about it is often deferred until later and later keeps receding into the distance because something more important is always needing to be done first. And women are after all an adjunct to the main struggle, which is the class struggle rather than an important struggle in their own right. I just to... Impressed by the Kurdish women's struggle for gender equality and feeling the urgency of educating the broader public about it, Meredith wrote her last book entitled A Road Unforeseen, 
Women Fight the Islamic State. She believed that the success of the Kurdish women's autonomous organizing within the lar larger liberation movement presented an answer to the question that she had been preoccupied with from her early days of political engagement. Namely, how could we make sure that women didn't end up behind the eight ball as we had in all the other revolutions? Moreover, she saw Rojava's directly democratic system of governance based on ecology, ethnic pluralism, and the full participation of women as a model for people around the world looking for alternative forms of social organization. They are trying to do something that in the US we call participatory democracy. That means democracy that is not just about voting and not just about turning out every four years to vote for somebody, but it's about how your life runs. So let's say you live in an apartment building of 400 people. That would be a commune. You would elect your officers and your commune would decide on things like, where should we get the electricity from? How do we generate it if we don't have any place to get it from? Does everybody here have uh, enough food? Uh, all these basic things, as well as deciding policy questions and contributing people to the local police force that's looking for ISIS, uh, you know, people invading or whatever. And uh, the education committee and the water committee and all these things. These are all decided democratically and people elect their own officers and there are certain rules. One is that each of these organizations, communes, and all the way up the scale uh, on different committees and any other civil society organizations, each has to have 40% uh, women participating at least. And they all have co-chairs, one man and one woman usually, although it could be two women if no man steps up. <laughs> um, and But always it has to be at least one woman. And this integrates women into a democratic structure as it evolves from the ground up. They, they are... oh. Meredith was adamant in defending Rajava, first co-founding the North America Rajava Alliance and later the Emergency Committee for Rajava. She remained on the latter steering committee until the very end, even as she was battling cancer in the last two years of her life. Meredith's determination, lifelong organizing experience, and brilliant strategic, strategic thinking were crucial for the growth and development of our organization over the last four years. Her genuine care for people, her generosity, and her love of a good laugh made our meetings more warm and welcoming, fostering the types of relationships that we all hope will be the basis for a better world. Meredith became a mentor a role model and a dear friend to many of us. She truly was and will remain the heart and the soul of the Emergency Committee for Rojava. In this final section, we will first hear from Sinam Mohammed, the represent representative of the Autonomous Administration of Northeast Syria in the US. Sinam, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you for everyone. It's my honor today to be with all the friends uh, of uh, my friend Meredith Tax. Actually, I was very honored to meet with her on, uh, in, in New York that time. It was a panel discussion in the, city, the New York City University and she was sitting till now, I remember her sitting in the front line. And that time I was talking about the, the Rojava system, the plurality, the diversity, the, the equal genders, how the women could take their role in all the institution in the in, in Rojava system. So after I finished the, the, the panel discussion, she, I, she came to me and she said, it was wonderful to hear from you all these things, sister. So that time, I really, I mean, was honored to meet with her. And that time she gave me this scarf, which I'm wearing now. It is a scarf from her and telling me 
that this is yours. I brought it for you. And it is pure silk because you deserve what are, whatever you wear. So I'm proud today I'm wearing this and always I'm wearing this scarf because to remind me with such a great woman that she defends the woman rights. She defends the human rights. She was very, I mean, dedicating her life for the human rights and for the Rojava as a Kurdish people in their struggle against the chauvinists, against the, the, you know, the tyrannies. And she knows very well that the women in Rojava, they were the women that they were fighting against the Islamic states. And that time when she wrote the book, she shared me some ideas. What do you think about this? And we were discussing. I was really very honored to have such a great woman that we will remember her all our life. She is now not with us, but I'm very sure that her spirit is now with us and watching us, telling us that you have to continue. Whatever we start, you have to continue. Supporting Rojava, supporting the women rights, supporting the Kurdish freedom, I mean, uh, for the, you know, their movement and their struggle. And this is what we need now. In Rojava, we could build a system that based on equal gender, a system that based on freedom of religions, no difference between Yazidis, Muslim, Christians, Jewish, whatever is it. This is the model that we need in Rojava, in North, in Syria, actually. We were struggling till to, since 2011, and we are struggling that time. So till now we are been, uh, 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 working in order to fulfill all the things that she believes in and she supported us in all this, I mean, uh, our, uh, you know, uh, uh, struggle in, in the North East Syria and all over Syria, because we need a model in Syria to be the unity through all the diversity which we have. Don't deny any diversity. As you know, Syria is diverse. Like we have Kurdish people, we have Arabs, we have Syriac, Christians, Yazidis, and so on. We need to see all these people working together in a democratic system, pluralistic system, equal gender, where the women they were leading the, the, the you know the, the 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 country toward democracy. All of us know no democracy without the women rights, no democracy without the human rights, and this is what we really working on. And really, we are now, I mean, we could achieve a lot of things uh, about that. And when she wrote even, I mean, in Rojava Committee, Emergency Committee, really, I would like to thank them for all the efforts they did. I would like to thank Zdebi Pakshan. I would like to thank all the women who is in, in I mean, now all the people who are here and who are supporting Rojava. I, I know that time at the, on this, in, in 2016 and 2015, when I was in New York, she asked me in the university that panel, what should we do for you? How can we support you? And that time I said, I have an idea. Maybe you can create a group, make it Rojava Solidarity Committee, whatever you can, only to support the people. And this is the beginning. And let us see now, where are we now? So really, I'm so proud and thank you so much and hope that we can continue together in order to see a system in the Middle East that will not deny any people who is living together. This is what we need to see, a democracy, plurality and women rights. Thank you so much. It was an honor to, for me to be such a great woman and for you also to meet you all here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sinam. Thank you. Next, we have Nulifar Koch, who is member of the Executive Council and spokesperson for the Commission on Foreign Relations of the Kurdistan 
National Congress, KNK. -K. Nidufash, the floor is Thank yours. You. Thank you, Islam. But today I won't speak on behalf of my Congress, instead on behalf of um, my comrades in the mountains in Rojava and Bakur Kurdistan, uh, because when Anya asked me to participate in the gateway in March, I was writing to the Kurdish women's movement, to the, to the women who are writing history. And they asked me to speak on their behalf, uh, to share the, the pain of the, of the family and the friends of Meredith. And they say, um, Meredith is also lost for us because we, we met her very late. Uh, and particularly after she was speaking about Rojava's revolution, and last year when she passed away, um, the Kurdish women's movement wrote the condolence letter to her family and friends of Meredith. And later on, I personally met her, not private, personally, unfortunately, uh, not, I didn't have the chance to meet her personally, but thanks to Debbie, somehow we, we get in some close friendship in a very short time. And uh, we had exchanges of several emails. And I realized that Meredith uh, is a woman, amazing woman who could see the things with the third eye. So um, this capacity see, seeking the things with the third eye um, can be just improve, um, imp improved when, we, when someone is spending her life to find the truth. And at that time, I wrote to Meredith said, well, um, I think you discovered Rojava's women's revolution or the Kurdish women's revolution because it's a implementation of your utopia. So it's your revolution because this, uh, this young revolution is, a, is a happening because of the contribution of women like uh, Meredith with her ideas. Uh, so that's her, I said, this is your revolution. Might, might be it happening in other places of the world, in Kurdistan, in whatever, in a different part of the world, but the books her, she wrote, the analysis she made, and she was, best, she was very different comparing with several feminists because she was always looking for links between past and present, for, between theory and praxis. These are the things we are missing today in feminist movements, uh, unfortunately. And she believed that through women's power, we can change the society and politics. And this is exactly what we are experimenting in Rojava's revolution, not just in Rojava, but generally in Kurdistan. And I'm happy that we had also the contribution of Meredith because she wrote in her book and tried to explain this revolution to uh, those who didn't know so much, who couldn't see with the third eye the sense of the revolution. And um, unfortunately, there was no time uh, for me to meet her personally, but um, um, when Debbie introduced us to each other, so in a very short time, I felt I know this woman for decades. Uh, I don't know, we wrote often emails because we have some similar experiences in case of health problems. And, but she was very powerful. So when she wrote about her health situation, so we, I made some advices, gave to her and so, um, well, there's a saying, say, I felt I liked her from the first sight. <laughs> uh, and she has a special place um, in my heart. And then part when she sent her book, the I wrote Unforeseen Women Fighting Islamic State, she wrote the letter to me and said, we have to continue with this revolution. I said, well, this is our promise to women like you and other women who are still continuing the struggle for a human rights of women and uh, believing in power of women, which uh, is the only power which can change, change the world. So, and as, a, as on behalf of my friends, I can assure you that we will continue to realize the dream of Meredith and all other women, and particularly of Meredith, because, um, because in, this, in, in a country like the US, which is uh, supportive of the state, she was uh, one of the person who was looking from the bottom, solidarity from the bottom, solidarity from the grassroots. And this was a st strengthening for us when we have seen the state is using uh, the opportunities to help the Turkish state, but Meredith was on our side. And I'm very honored and proud to, to knew such a great, amazing women. Thank you also to inviting me to speak to here. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Nilüfer. Thank you so much to all the Kurdish women revolutionaries also who shared that message with us today. Um, we will now turn to Erica Goldman, who is the publisher and editorial director of Bellevue Literary Press, which published Meredith's A Road Unforeseen, Women Fight the Islamic State in 2016. Erica, the floor is yours. I've just unmuted myself, thank you. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me to contribute today. Uh, what I had prepared to say has mostly been covered by everyone else. Obviously, um, there are many people here today who knew Meredith for many, many years. I came into her life uh, in the 90s in a marginal way. Uh, as an admirer of the work she was doing with Women's World. And we spoke uh, sporadically uh, over the following years. Ultimately, uh, as someone who was luck lucky enough to receive her newsletter, I read about the Rojava uh, women and their heroism. And uh, we agreed that we would work together on uh, what became a road unforeseen. Uh, she had the remarkable ability to transmit the complexity clearly of what was going on in Rojava in the context of uh, the political history of that period and of the Kurdish movement. And she covered it profoundly uh, and as I said, clearly, in a way that went far beyond what uh, the information uh, transmitted uh, that we had accessible to us as progressive Americans li listening to public radio. So I was grateful to her for educating me. Um, she embodied her beliefs, carrying them matter of factly, in spite of failing health and countercurrents of prevailing fashion. For me, she was aware, a rare, inspiring figure, a journalist, novelist, and scholar who was also a practical activist. What impressed me most was how she maintained her idealism, no matter how grim the overarching political climate. Her work in defense of Rojava was entirely consistent with her lifelong political commitments, as we have heard today. I never knew her to express disillusionment or cynicism, even in the darkest times. Aware of how shattered I was by Trump's election, she checked in with me periodically. I remember in particular a walk we took together. As I despaired of the possibility for a positive change, she spoke of the value of work on the community level. There was always hope for her Pessimism was an unaffordable luxury. I loved Meredith. I was inspired by her and I miss her deeply. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Erica. We will now have Debbie Bookchin, who is a journalist and author. She co-founded the Emergency Committee for Rojava with Meredith and others. Debbie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ozlan, and thank you to everybody. I, it's so wonderful to see so many friends of Meredith's here, and, and everybody has spoken so eloquently about the many, many dimensions of Meredith's work and her personality and just captured her dedication, her dedication and warmth so brilliantly. I'm just grateful to be sharing this moment with all of you. You know, I first met Meredith through Nesta King and Estra back in 2015. And I, I once worked closely with Bernie Sanders as his press secretary. And Nesta emailed me wanting me to get Bernie to stop the sale of US smart bombs to Turkey, which would of course be used against the Kurds. And she had CC'd Meredith. 
And I wrote back and explained briefly, you know, why Sanders would be reluctant to get involved, that kind of other political stuff. And I got back this brief, but really friendly email from Meredith who thanked me and informed me that there would soon be a solidarity group for Roja performing in New York. And I was living in New York at the time and her email included this sentence that she said, there has been some solidarity work done by anarchists and Kurds, but it needs to be much broader and draw in people who know how to pressure the government and raise money as well as do grassroots work and have demonstrations. My, my first thought on reading this succinct and sort of everything rolled into one sentence was, wow, this person is a serious energetic organizer. And then a, a kind of a picture formed in my mind and I still will never really exactly understand why, but I imagined her you know, with all this energy as being about 30 years old and having long hair some sort of braided running down her back. Well. Of course, when I met her at a Rojava Solidarity organizing meeting a few weeks later, um, needless to say, she wasn't a 30 year old with a braid, but rather this fabulously energetic, short, boxy Jewish dynamo who knew exactly what she thought and exactly how to organize to get it. She had the charisma, smarts and know-how to draw people to her like a magnet. And she had the savvy to attach herself to people who she thought would roll up their sleeves and work just as hard as she did. And so of course we zeroed in on each other and worked on these two organizations, including ECR as other people have mentioned. And, and you know, it was just, she imbued this sense that, that, that any women's movement in order to to succeed that any movement, any radical movement had to embody the values of the Kurdish women's movement, which is, was you know, a, a paradigm really for a radical restructuring of society that embraced neither centralized socialism nor a kind of amorphous anarchism, but that empowered people in their neighborhoods with women leading the way. Her commitment to the Kurdish women's movement was truly unwavering and boundless. And, and I also want to emphasize, just as others have said, how completely selfless she was in taking all of us at ECR under her wing, sharing the enormous depths of her knowledge, not only about history and women's struggles, but about how to organize, how to speak effectively, write as effectively as possible and bring others into the organization with that same sense of you know equality and as others have mentioned never sort of pulling rank but to build and, and build an organization together um, with everybody's voice being equally important in every respect she practiced the politics of bringing women to the fore Nurturing or nurturing our abilities and teaching us and really never asking anything in return. The, the wisdom that that Meredith brought to ECR was essential. She was the first and last person we consulted about everything from fundraising to demonstrating. She was always ready to do the work and push forward the cause with everything she had. Her perspective, her knowledge, her skills as an organizer from a generation past were really invaluable to us. And frankly, are still very badly needed on the left if we're ever to accomplish real social change. But, but the other thing which others have mentioned is just how much Meredith cared for us like a family. She was always available to all of us with advice, whether medical or personal or romantic or otherwise. And of course, uh, you know, as Mia mentioned uh, and others have said, you, you couldn't visit her without being sent home with food, clothing, books or, or furniture <laughs> and, and, and was always ready also at the end of the phone line to just discuss ideas or have a laugh. Her, her pure, beautiful laugh, which was so big hearted and, and reminded you that like, a revolution wasn't worth having if you couldn't dance to it. I feel that that all of us at ECR, you know, taught us that Meredith taught us what true sisterhood looks like. And I just want to say a couple more things. First, I wanted to mention <clears throat> how deeply she loved Eli, Jamila, and her grandson Gus. She was so proud of everything 
everything about you, Eli, from the way you handled your demanding job to the way you pursued and eventually won over your amazing partner, Jamila, whom she also boasted about as being one of the most kind and capable people she'd ever met. And then of course there was Gus, the charming, smart and handsome grandson. She deeply relished every moment she spent with him and loved to update us on his ever growing cleverness. He brought her so much happiness. I, I can honestly say that the only time she ever made it clear she wasn't to be bothered was while she was babysitting Gus, that time was sacred. And the last thing I wanted to say on a very personal note is this, you know, when in 2006, I lost my father who was a great social theorist and a great mind of the 20th century, I felt like I had lost the one person in my life who made the world coherent for me. But then by some incredible grace, Meredith came into my life. And like my father, Meredith knew not just what to think about things, but how to think about things. She was that rare individual who combined intelligence, humanity, and common sense with a command of history, especially radical social history, that made the world coherent for everyone around her. Meredith was fierce, kind, tenacious, generous, open, intimate, witty, and truly warm-hearted. And as, as others have pointed out, she was truly a living artery connecting generations of leftist feminists. I'm so grateful to have had her in my life, even if it was not as long as the many decades that others did. Um, her loss as a loyal friend and as a brilliant mentor is immeasurable. We miss her every day. And as we continue our work at ECR, Meredith really will be forever our guiding spirit. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Debbie, for sharing those. And also on behalf of all of us at the Emergency Committee for Rojava, we deeply do miss her. And um, we just realized that Nestra King is now with us. Nestra, um, would you like to share your words about Meredith now? Anya, is, do you know if Nestra is still with us? I'm asking Nestra okay. to unmute. Let's see. Okay. Hi. Oh. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. I just got on. Um, I just got an, a text from Debbie that about uh, that this was going on. So I went looking for the link, which I have not seen. So I'm sorry. Um, uh, and can I just uh, listen for a while, um, if that would be okay? Of I mean, course. I, of course. I would really appreciate that to get the feel for what's going on. I mean, Debbie was just gave a wonderful, wonderful talk. So. I'll listen, but hello, everybody. I'm glad to be here. Nice to have you here, Nestra, and anytime. We're actually now approaching the end. We will. I will ask if there are other people who would like to say a word, and after which we will um, close with a short clip that's showing us Meredith again talking, which I know now. We all miss her so much. It will be nice to end with her. But um, please raise your hand, unmute yourself if you would like to share. Ruth, please go ahead. Yes, I'm, you know, I was a childhood friend of Meredith's and stayed intermittently and strongly connected to her throughout her life. And uh, when we were in high school, you know, she was in my wedding. We, we really went back a long way. Um, and when she was in high school, she wrote a column for the newspaper. And um, you could see, when I look back at these columns, she was so present in them, and it was a forecast of what her life was going to be like, the struggle for all the struggles that she worked for were reflected. Uh, and I just want to say how touching and um, appreciative I am of the words that have been said about her. Essentially, the depth of friendship that she offered um, was consistent and um, 
I can hear it reflected in everyone's comments about her, that there was the political and there was the personal, and they were deeply, deeply connected and supportive. And I just wanted to appreciate everyone, particularly Eli, for participating in all of this. Thank you for a job well done. Thank you, Ruth. Anasara, please. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll keep it brief. Um, I'm, I just wanted to say I'm, I'm very honored to meet so many of Meredith long-term friends, co-organizers, and family. Thanks so much, Eli, Eli for coming to, and thanks to all of you for sharing um, both very touching and very informative memories and, um, and anecdotes about uh, Meredith. Um, this has been wonderful. I've only known Meredith since the early 2018, uh, spring of the 2018, but she made an enormous impression on me uh, and I learned a lot from her about politics and history, about activism and organizing and about life. So we met through the mutual engagement in the Kurdish question. Um, I had co-written a piece um, about the impending invasion of Afrin called Feminism Across Borders that eventually came out in Depo. Um, and suddenly I got the Facebook friend request and a message from the great Meredith Tax. You know, she wrote, and she, here I'm quoting her first message to me. Hi, Anna Sara. That's a great piece that you and your friend did. There are so few of us who get the importance of Rajava. And we have, so, we have to find a way to make our voices louder. Do you have time to talk on the phone, to brainstorm about how to do this? I'm in New York City, so there's a three hour time difference. And of course, this is probably the best pickup line I've ever received. <laughs> and I loved the directness and efficiency of the request or invitation. I mean, it was just awesome. And of course, there had already been background work by her and there'd been others, but roughly a month later, we had a publication in the New York Review of Books, we had started ECR, and we were having regular discussions over a video call and email about strategy, organizational structure, um, the political development, and so on. Along the way in all of this, we also became friends, and she was incredibly supportive of me when I faced a sort of crisis the following year. So I, I did, I'm very, very sad I didn't get to say bye to her, but I'm extremely grateful to have known Meredith. And I miss her terribly. Thank you, Anna Sara. Um, we had Ariane. Ariane Burnett, your hand was up. Would you like to share? Sorry. Yes. I, I just want to say that I'm, I'm, I'm very moved by what people are saying. And that in my memory, of course, Merozit is a, is a beacon. <laughs> not only for feminist thinking, but also for her visionary views, her capacity to go beyond what we think uh, in, in the normal, you know, in, in the present, but always going beyond, always finding the, 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 the way into, bringing us closer to, to uh, uh, unifying our thoughts on this particular issue. She was a friend. That's all I can say. She was a deep friend and I miss her terribly. But I'm also very lucky to have known the, the rigor of feminist thinking through her. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Others? Anya, would you like to? Yes, thank you so much. I mean, to be honest, uh, I have to be very brief because everything that I was planning to say has already been said, but I just want to reiterate how big Meredith's heart was. And I am one of those young people with whom she was able to connect just like this. And I met her first in 2018 after the CR was just founded and, um, you know, it it was opened up to public to start building a solidarity mass movement. And um, I always felt that she was the glue that really held the group together. We would have our meetings in person in New York City, and she would ask all kinds of questions to basically anyone who would walk in to our meetings. She would always get very personal and very friendly. And uh, despite all the generational differences, she was uh, usually the oldest person in the room. And yet she always felt like one of us. Um, 
she was able to connect uh, you know, incredibly. And, you know, uh, and she was the most distinguished person in the room most of the time. She was this distinguished writer and uh, feminist organizer with a name. And yet she really cared about everyone in our group. As Avram mentioned earlier, she really treated everyone in the room respectfully and as equals, even when she disagreed on you know, various issues and that she did a lot. She, you know, she had her clear um, beliefs and uh, goals and she disagreed, but um, always uh, in a way that um, we learned uh, from her and she learned from us. And you know, I don't, I, I don't, I don't take this for granted. You know, her generosity and her warmth and her approachability. Um, seen how the hierarchies of status and importance get perpetrated, even in leftist and you know leftist intellectual circles. Uh, people are just too absorbed in their own achievements, in their own egos. But Meredith had zero of that, just absolutely zero. And that's one of the things that um, I want to thank her. You know, for giving us. Thank you. Thank you, Anya. Thank you. Um, are there others who want to share? I don't see any hands at the moment. Um, Elif, you would like to read out a statement from American Kurdish Association? Um, please go ahead. Sorry, could you just give me one moment? I'm just getting it. I'm just getting it. Thank yes, you so much. Sure. I mean, while we're waiting, I'm also going to say just a word about her openness and her curiosity. I thought that for me, Meredith, you know, and I had our differences, um, but she was always so open to listen. And she, you know, always said, of course, we're going to disagree and sometimes fight. And we did, and I, I, I think that was also very important and her ongoing curiosity about the world, like about the Kurdish women's movement. She was waiting for Dilar Dirik's book to come out. I actually wrote that book to read pieces from it to her when she was in the hospital during her last days. And, and I remember holding her hand and it was just, she just was so hungry to, to hear about what's happening in the movement, what new writing is coming out. And, um, and she asked me, is it an academic book or is it like approachable? Because she also had this critique of academics and you know how they can be very separated as Nilufar said, this, this, this uh, gap between theory and praxis and she really cared deeply about um, connecting those and really deeply thinking about the world, but putting it into action. Um, so that that was all so beautiful while we were waiting for the American Kurdish Association statement. And I hear that Ruth um, wanted to. I, I would just love to share. I put this in the chat, but I yes. would like to share this. You know, um, she wrote this in high school and I just think it was uh, prophetic. It says, my last words of dubious wisdom are these, don't be afraid of getting involved or excited or having strong opinions about things. They say that not caring is the vice of our generation, that we're content just to slide through life, remaining uncommitted and uninvolved. I think it would be terrible to lead an uninvolved life in a comfy little insulated shell. I'm all for tilting with windmills and crusading and picketing lunch counters personally. If you get into more trouble that way, at least you know you're alive. So she was who she was from the beginning, let me tell you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Ruth. I wonder if Eli Elif is back. Elif, are yes, you... um, if there aren't any other speakers, I would just like to read out this message um, from the American Kurdish Association on behalf of the American Kurdish Association. Please, please go ahead. Uh, apologies if this is a little repetitive because it was written when we found out that we lost uh, Meredith. So 
Have all know we are very sad to announce that after a long battle with cancer, we've lost a dear friend to our cause, Meredith Tax. Meredith over the years has shown nothing but unwavering support and dedication towards Kurdish women's movement, American Kurdish Association, and the Kurdish community of New York, uh, New York City and New Jersey. She entered this work, work with Kurdish women's movement already having established herself a legacy in radical feminism in USA. She was one of the founders of one of our constant collaborators, Emergency Committee for Rojava, which continues tirelessly to support Kurdish women movement in Rojava and abroad. She also founded the North, America, uh, North American Rojava Alliance in 2015, following the ISIS attacks on Kobane. She co-founded many important feminist organizations, including the Committee for Abortion Rights and Against Sterilization Abuse, the Women's World Organization for Rights, Literature and Democracy, the Pan American Center Women's Committee, the Center for Secular Space. It has been an honor for us to work with her over these years. Her legacy will live on with us as we continue our struggle against totalitarian regimes in the region. Junjian Azadi, rest in power. Thank you. Thank you, Elif, and thank you, American Kurdish Association, for that message. Um, Ganesh, please. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, hi, Oslam, and uh, uh, hello to everyone over here. Um, and thank you for organizing this really wonderful uh, space for remembering. Um, I'm remembering a comrade that was so uh, full of energy and so full of uh, so many wonderfully rich ideas. Um, absolute inspiration, lovely person. Um, so thank you. I'm just that I just wanted to say that and nothing else. Thank you. Thank you, Ganesh. And if there is anyone else, I know this, this is emotional for all of us. And so um, thank you everyone who have shared. If you have also want to contribute, want to say a word before our last clip, please go ahead. If you don't know how to raise your hand, you can simply speak, unmute yourself and speak. Well, I want to once again thank everyone. And um, we will now close with a three minute video, which features Meredith discussing the importance of a strong women's movement from Rojava to South America, to Sudan, to the US. We at the Emergency Committee for Rojava hope to carry on her internationalist feminist work for a better world for all. And thank you everyone for being here, for sharing those words about our dear beloved, beloved Meredith. One reason Rojava was able to defeat ISIS when nobody else can is that they fully integrate women's leadership on every level, from the neighborhood commune to the top military command, and thus they are able to draw on the strength of the whole society. And as people have said, this is part of a long history. Um, it, was, it wasn't easy. The women had to fight to get into this position. Um, that when hundreds of them in the early 90s, went to the mountains to join the PKK. They didn't get a warm welcome from most of the male guerrillas. Some of the commanders wanted to send them home. Some wanted to marry them, but the women persisted. And they were encouraged by the PKK's leader, Abdullah Ocalan, to organize autonomous women's military units and play a leading role in the party. And this turned out to be very important because the women's ideas of what should be done turned out to be opposed to the approach favored by some leading commanders. And thus the change that resulted from including autonomous women's units was not only quantitative, but qualitative and resulted in uh, backing away from a purely military reproach, approach and a new line that emphasized community organizing and negotiations with Turkey. Compare this with the operating system of any progressive organization you have ever been in. Compare the strength and resilience of the movement that beat ISIS with the strength we are gonna need in our battle against the global right. 
and look at the women's movement globally. Now, it's not as strong as it was in the 90s. Who is? It's weaker. It's more NGO based than the Kurdish women's movement, but it still has enormous strength as shown by massive Latin American marches against violence and for abortion rights, the leadership of women in places like Sudan, the huge diverse U US women's resistance movement exemplified by the work of Black Lives Matter, the rising majority and the women's marches all led by women of color. Think how much stronger we could be if this feminist movement and the progressive movement internationally were partners. Thank you everyone for being with us today. We will now stop the recording. Um, thank you, it was really meaningful.